Good morning, Monco, and welcome back to the third edition of our online adult Sunday school. If you are watching this and you are not a member of Monco Bible Fellowship, I also welcome you. It is April the 12th. We are also celebrating our Resurrection Sunday, which means that he is risen. Jesus is alive and he is risen. That's the reason that we as believers have a hope that's beyond the hope of this world. So we're April 12th, 2020. My name is Charles Foster. As I said, this is the Monco Bible Fellowship Adult Sunday School Online. And we've gone this way since the coronavirus situation has really escalated with the quarantine. We have been doing our Sunday School by looking at a biblical survey a biblical survey looking at the bigger picture of each individual book of the Bible. So as we've gone through them, we've gone through those first 12 books, the first set of five, the Pentateuch, uh, the Law, and the Torah, those historical books. And now we are on the books of wisdom or poetry. When we start Ecclesiastes today, we're going to start out with a film clip. We're going to start out with the very first introduction, scripture, introduction of the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter one, and that's gonna go right into probably a very familiar clip of film that to some of us, especially some of us that may be uh, of a certain age, I'll say. So let's take a look at that. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does anyone gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say? Look, this is something new. <laughs> it was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of people of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. That clip, which started out with Ecclesiastes, chapter one right there, that's the introduction. And I chose to use that version because it's very dramatic and it really sets the tone for the book and it also flows so well into the clip that we saw. Now that clip you should know is from a very famous movie. Oops, not that one. There we go. <laughs> a very famous movie that is critically acclaimed, and a lot of directors see it as the movie that caused them to become directors, Citizen Kane. And the way it's related to Ecclesiastes is that the scene you saw there in Citizen Kane is the very beginning of the movie, and the, the main character that Orson Welles plays, Charles Foster, nice ring to it, right? Charles Foster Kane, he is 
on his deathbed at that point where it opens up and it kind of pans into the bedroom right there. You see that very familiar up close uh, look of the mouth kind of mouthing out rosebud, hand drops, snow scene, the little globies hold, holding falls, breaks. And then the nurse comes in and, and covers him and indicating that he's dead. And now it kind of fades away. Well, that is a tool that a lot of movies use, of course, that starts with the end. And then you're kind of wondering what's going on, what's brought you to this point, or what's brought you to this point, I should say. And then they go back in the movie to the beginning of his life when he's a child, and you kind of see how this occurs. This person really became bitter, cynical, angry, depressed, and becomes that character that they finally cover at the very end. The book of Ecclesiastes really opens the same way because what you heard being said there in the introduction and what Solomon goes on to say in the very beginning of the book there are some very negative, almost defeatist kind of statements. And when you read that, you kind of think, what am I reading here? But then as you go to chapter two, you see Solomon begin to show you what he did and what he experienced to bring him to the point where he's making those kind of statements. So it's a very, it's, 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 it's a parallel there. And a lot of movies certainly do it. But what's interesting is that Solomon penned it and the Lord certainly governed it through the Holy Spirit, did that before movies were even invented. So you see that quality right there. Just to kind of give you a little bit of background, the very first verse in the book of Ecclesiastes said the words of the preacher, right? Son of David, King of, King of Jerusalem, which certainly identifies him as Solomon. A lot of people use that term preacher and it's okay as a definition, but that comes from the word Ecclesiastes, the book is named uh, after. That's from a Greek word that people translate preacher. Probably a better rendering would be another word we're going to get into, because when you think of a preacher, you kind of think of what I just pulled up right there. And certainly nothing wrong with Billy Graham, but he's not preaching in that kind of sense. So let's take a look at it. If he was preaching from what you just heard and what you hear in the rest of the book, the picture down at the bottom would be what his church was looked like, because this guy is saying some negative stuff. Here we go. Koheleth. Now, that's a Hebrew word that is used originally. And then when it was translated to Greek early on, you get the word Ecclesiastes that we call it and refer to it as. And we know that word from the word ecclesia. That's the church, the called out ones. But Koheleth right there, that original word, it means a little bit more than preacher. It can mean teacher. It means one who collects sayings and one who espouses them, one who gathers people together and teaches. So it's not a preacher in the way we think of a preacher, but one who's speaking out to others. We're going to take a look at Pastor Landon again. And those of us who have been with me either in online or in person know we've used him a lot because he has a very good way of giving a quick synopsis of various books of the Bible. So as we take a look at this, he's going to elaborate more on the very short part of Ecclesiastes that we're going to be doing today. Ecclesiastes, it's a painful, dark book trying to climb life's highest peaks and just survive life's lowest valleys. Ecclesiastes is about purpose, a quest that millions find themselves on today. What's my purpose? Why am I here? Why does life feel this way? It was written by the man who had everything, who did everything, who knew as much as a human could possibly know. One of the richest men in history, king of one of the great countries of his time, married to over 700 women. Well, that last one's not so good. Solomon. Born through adultery and murder, his own half-brother tried to kill his dad. Solomon knew God and was given more wisdom than any before or after. He wrote three of the books of wisdom, Proverbs, this, and Song of Solomon. Those other two represent two of his peaks. This one, Ecclesiastes, represents the bottom of the bottom, the gutter of the gutter. He was the wisest, richest, and most famous person of his time, like Jeff Bezos mixed with Kanye mixed with Einstein. But he found out that it's all kind of just empty. 
Ecclesiastes is what happens when you find out that all you pursued wasn't worth it, that life for life's sake is empty, that money for money's sake is empty, that it's all just empty. The word he uses is vanity. He uses it a lot, 38 times in the book. It means vapor or breath or emptiness. For chapters 1 and 2, the old king explains what he means, posing big questions. He starts with a poem about the cyclical nature of life, and then that poem becomes his style. His point, there's nothing new. Everything's recycled and forgotten. Solomon talks about having seen it all, enjoyed it all, and the emptiness that follows. The emptiness of pleasure, the emptiness of pursuit of wisdom, and the emptiness of work. Chapter 118 says, For in much wisdom there's much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Man, this is sad stuff. Chapters 3 through 6 are the examples of vanity. There's a beautiful poem about the times for everything in the world. Solomon talks about the immutability of God, the inevitability of death, the oppression and evil of man, the forgetting of strong leaders, laziness, business failures, working for money, only to not take it with you when you die. Die being the last words he said, and that's so appropriate with the Citizen Kane clip, the way Solomon begins to lay this book out, and just some of the things that Pastor Landon put out there. I mean, he went through a lot, but there's a lot of depressing subjects that you saw there. So let's see where Solomon is going with this. That word that, that Pastor Landon talked about, vanity. It's used 38 times, as he says, in this book. And it's, it's the Hebrew word, Havel, right? And even though it means vanity, as we translate it in English, we have a perception of vanity sometimes that doesn't really do it justice. Because sometimes you can think of vanity as just somebody who's vain, somebody who's prideful. But it, it, it's, it's a lot more than that. You see some versions that say meaningless. And that doesn't really capture it. That's why I have the word vapor there, because that's what it's really about. And next to it, I have the word absurd. If you think of vapor, you think of something that is there, you try to grab it, and then it's gone. And that's the way Solomon is really describing life in this book. The reason I chose the word absurd is because that's the way a lot of the 20th century existentialist uh, philosophers talked about life. Guys like Kierkegaard, guys like, um, why am I drawing the blank? Thank you. <laughs> guys like Nietzsche and then Jean-Paul Sartre. And I'm not going to go into them too much because I know what the results will be at home. So we'll just move on. But if you look at the picture right here, the imagery you have right here, it's this person trying to chase and get a hold of the wind. Now, that's absurd in itself if you see that, right? But that's the term that Solomon uses. It's about, it's almost like chasing after the wind. So now you get a better idea. It, it, it's a lot more than just meaningless. Because that uh, Hebrew word that's used is a very unique Hebrew word that's not really used a lot. And Solomon specifically chose that to really express what he wants to say. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Now, that person there is Jim Fix. And a lot of people who are maybe my age, a little older or something, remember Jim Fix because he was a runner. As he says right there, he wrote the book on running. This guy was in excellent shape. He ate well. He ran every day. His body was like a machine, dropped dead of a heart attack. I think it actually happened when he was jogging. And that's the absurdity that those philosophers were speaking about. That's what that's what Solomon is talking about. It almost seems unfair. And of course, fairness is not a biblical construct. But when we were doing Proverbs the last time, remember we talked about a proverb deals with generalities and not the exception? What you see here with Jim Fix is an example of that kind of exception. Because most people who live that kind of lifestyle are not going to die young from a heart attack. And that's why the Proverbs are general. But like we said, when you come to Ecclesiastes and when you come to Job, then you're really talking about the exception of when life doesn't seem to work out the way we would like it to from our perspective. Under the sun, there's nothing new under the sun. That is the key term and phrase that's used throughout this book. And it's used 29 times because what it's really about is Solomon is trying to 
explain th just the absurdity of life the way he sees it from an earthly perspective, from a perspective that doesn't include God. So you're talking about a secular type of uh, uh, perspective. And I'm not talking about someone who's an atheist that's saying God doesn't exist and they could be included in there. But what I'm talking about, probably a bigger population of people is the people who would say, oh yeah, sure, I believe in God, but they don't live their lives like he's even there. Unfortunately, there are some people who are in the church, and you probably know of some, who live their lives in such a way where they do all these things and they live their life, but God is not even a part of it. So really they're living under the sun as opposed to above the sun in heaven. As we go through this book, it's gonna be broken down probably right in half. And we're going to go, as I said, to the end of chapter two. But as we start off, kind of reviewing some of the words of Solomon here in this introduction in chapter one. That's what you heard in that dramatic reading. And Solomon, of course, there is just talking about how nature just goes on and on year after year. The sun comes up, the sun goes down, rises in the east, sets in the west. And it's almost like he's just frustrated by that because life is just so monotonous. Now, to be honest, Solomon better be thankful because if that sun didn't come up, we'd be all dead, we'd be frozen. But remember, it's done from a perspective that's under the sun, only man's perspective. And Solomon is not giving you God's perspective that this world that he's looking at is not the way it was originally created. And it's also not the way it's going to be. So let's move on. Nothing seems to satisfy. He talks about you work hard, and for what? You don't really get any satisfaction out of that. He talks about our physical senses. The eye is never satisfied. The ear is never satisfied. And what that means is, look at the picture of the body. A lot of people might recognize that because that's when, I don't know which version, but some new iPhone was coming out. And you had people there lined up overnight to get it. Why? The eye. They saw it. They saw the advertisement. I got to have it. Oh, no, look at that thing. That one has three on uh, little holes there instead of two. And they all run out and get it. And you know why the eye is never satisfied? Because six months later, oh, man, this thing is not what I thought. When's the next one? Oh, look at this advertisement. That one has a blue case. I got to have it. The eye is never satisfied. Nothing new under the sun. We kind of went through that. But look at number three there. We simply don't remember the past, nor will the future remember the present. And I heard somebody talking about this one time, and they asked quickly, without thinking, tell us your great, great, great grandfather. And a lot of people couldn't do it. A lot of us might not be able to do it. We, we might have to look or look at a family tree or something. But the sad part is that that's going to be us one day. They're going to be all Thanksgiving, you know, three generations from now. And somebody's going to be saying, oh, what was his? name Carl Foster that, that's life here we go nothing new under the sun let's move on <laughs> under the sun if you take that and put it into a philosophical perspective it's essentially naturalism which is a philosophy that believes that everything came about from nature, from natural properties and natural causes. And you get quotes like this as a result. The cosmos is all there is, all there ever was, and all there ever will be. A lot of you recognize that as Carl Sagan. He used to have that show Cosmos on PBS, you know, billions and billions. You know what I'm talking about if you remember. If that's all it ever is, all it ever will be, all it ever was, then you're, you're no more than a piece of this earth. There's no difference, no distinction between plants, animals, people. It's all the same. You take that to his logical, sad kind of ending, death is nature's way of saying your table is ready. Robin Williams obviously made that quote, and we know Robin Williams is no longer with us. The interesting thing, he's given a very naturalistic uh, statement there. And was his table ready? 
here's someone who had all the money he could want, had all the fame he could want, was respected in his field as a comedic genius and killed himself because it was something about all of that that obviously didn't satisfy. And if all you see is what's here under the sun, then it's hopeless. This is what Solomon does. Solomon has this little experiment. As Pastor Landon kind of touched on, he does five pursuits of happiness. He tries to see what kind of satisfaction, wisdom, pleasure, work, possessions, and women can give him. So let's take a look. Wisdom, number one, this is what he did. He says, I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. Essentially, that means Solomon went back to school, read everything he could find, studied everything he could study, got into a lot of Egyptian philosophy. And when he did all that and had all that knowledge, had all that wisdom, he realized, as he said, it's like chasing the wind. Here's the connection. While a lot of us don't go on that kind of quest, a lot of us do the same thing essentially because we think that, oh man, once I get that degree, once I get that master's, once I get that PhD, then everything is going to be different. And I am not saying don't go for that. I have a master's degree, I have two master's degree. My wife has a PhD, she has two, she has tons of them. <laughs> and we still aren't satisfied if we only have a perspective that's under the sun. Like I said, my wife and I have this, and a lot of you have that too, but that's not the thing. That can't be the thing, or it will result in frustration. He went after pleasure. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. So Solomon exposed himself and tested every kind of wine and drink you could have. Solomon had all kind of celebrations. Solomon had the best of foods, everything there. And you know what? This is empty. He's chasing after the wind. A lot of us also do that too, because we have a tendency to think, and I didn't have to bring up a picture because how many of us think that if we just have the finer things in life, the wine, the food, uh, the, the, the events and everything, that that's going to give us significance. And it leaves you empty. I have that picture there of the cast of Hamilton performing at the White House during the Obama administration because they came, they performed, people enjoyed it. President got up, said some great words. They went home. That probably wouldn't have happened in Solomon's day because he would have liked it so much. You know what? I'm going to pay you people to stay on my grounds. And whenever I want to be entertained, whether it's comedy, whether it's song, whether it's uh, dramatics, he snapped his finger, you come. He had that all the time and still felt like, is that all? It leaves you empty. Work. He saw it as his mission to, let's go back a little bit. I'll bring that up in a second. He saw it as his mission to, build these projects, to build homes, to plant vineyards, gardens, parks. He did all this stuff, own property, own flocks of herds of sheep and everything, camels. And you know what? He came to the end. What's it all mean? I got all this stuff and what does it mean? I, I've moved to this position where people are coming to see me, to hear my wisdom, and it's leaving me empty. That picture in the corner is a picture of his... Um, the temple that he built, it was one of the, the major attractions of the known world at the time. People just came and just were awestruck by it. I pulled this up a little earlier because this is our equivalent. If we can just get that promotion, if we can just get that position, that position of authority, that title, that money that goes along with it, that office with that view that he has that I've got to have, then I'm going to make it. And you get it and it's like, is that all? Some people are so distraught, they jump out of that window. Solomon next goes on to possessions. So that's a little different than the pleasures, because here's what he does. Look at that picture at the bottom. That's an illustration of the, basically inside of Solomon's chambers. Everything is gold. It says there that he amassed gold, he amassed silver. The silver was not even significant after a while. 
you read through a lot of the history, it talks about how they, how they would just grind up the silver and then they didn't even use it. They would grind up the gold and he would throw it on top of the hair of the men that would carry his chariot. You know how the king comes through the town and you got the guys, the big strong guys. They would just put the little gold, almost like glitter, gold dust in their hair. I mean, this guy was filthy rich. And all of that meant nothing. And you know that's us today. If I can get that house, that car, my dream house. Man, once I'm in there and out of this dump, and once I'm driving that ride, then it's going to be, and you know what? It's not going to be because you still feel empty. Once again, I'm not saying you can't have a nice house, you can't have a nice car, you can't get your degree, you can't have parties, you can't enjoy good food, but those can't be the end all to be all. Howard Hughes in the bottom corner right there had all the money, had all the wealth. You, a lot of you know how he ended up wearing boxes on his feet, hair's grown down to, you know, past his back, uh, long beard. Apparently nails were so long they were starting to curl up. He stayed in his room all the time. People who served him said the room smelled terrible because he was storing urine in there. And he was just urinating in jars and just keeping it all over and didn't want anybody taking it out. Like it was some kind of prize or something. And I'm not saying you're going to come to that point, but you are going to be left empty. Women, last thing Solomon does here. He got his harem. He has his women. Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines. A concubine is a woman whose sole purpose is to give you physical pleasure. I acquired male and female singers and a harem. And that the female, the male and female singers are related to the, the uh, earlier part. But look at this, the harem, why? For the, the delight of a man's heart, and you know what he's talking about. Here's the irony of this. Solomon is the person who in the previous book that we covered, Proverbs, penned, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. He who finds a wife. The guy who said that now had 700 of them. That is taking a good thing way too far. Solomon doesn't even know those women. And at the end, he's left empty. We do it in a different way today. No way we're gathering 700 you know, spouses or concubines or anything, but we kind of have that little fling. Things are kind of boring. It's time to get our groove back, right? And if I just do that, then I'm going to have some satisfaction to take me out of the bleakness. And once you get through all that, you're back where you started again. And sometimes you got to groove some more and you keep doing it over and over again. On the right there is a lot of men go through this. You reach that certain age. Things aren't what you quite thought they were going to be because you didn't get the house. You didn't get the fancy job. You didn't do all that. And if you do acquire that, you're empty. And now, you know what? I'm getting out of this relationship because I'm going to get my trophy wife, the one that's young and beautiful. And we do it. The last one, you are in this relationship that everybody around you can see is no good for you. And this guy is going to be bad news. But for some reason, you can't see it because, man, if I was just in a relationship, then things would be different. And you know that guy's going to leave you after dogging you probably. So when it's over, once again, you're still empty, even if you stay in it. There's an emptiness because that can't be the thing. Solomon discovered that for us. When, when that void is there and it can't be filled in all the ways we just went through, what the world under the sun starts to do is develop, well, we got to be able to explain this. It can't have anything to do with God. So then we come up with all these isms. And you see a lot of them listed over there. We talked about naturalism already when we talked about under the sun. Take a look at one right here. Humanism. Humanism, really some of the ones to the right can fall under humanism as subcategories. But what you see under the word humanism right there is a clip that I took off of an article I had read online where there's a humanist that's talking about Ecclesiastes. So this person doesn't even believe in God. And 
He loves the book because he's agreeing with it so much. But what he fails to realize when he's saying all this scripturally incorrect garbage is that the book is Solomon's perspective without God. Because if you get to chapter 12, Solomon brings it full circle and talks about the significance of God. I guess the person reading it didn't get to chapter 12 before they wrote the article. So this is how we're going to end things today. We're going to take a look at a very well-known, well, you look at that imagery, you know what that is. Very well-known film right here. And we'll see how we can tie things together. So let's take a look. But now you know there was a man named Jack Dawson and that he saved me. They've got you trapped, Rose. And you're gonna die if you don't break free. In every way that a person can be saved. You must promise me that you'll survive. <laughs> that you won't give up. No matter what happens. I don't even have a picture of him. He exists now only in my memory. He saved me in every way that a person can be saved. This is so fascinating to me because it is just the way the world attempts to make up for the void. Meaning, we're talking about humanism here. We're talking about what's under the sun. And essentially, what's happening here is a person is saving her. And I understand what she means when she says, he saved me, well, let's just say in numerous ways. Because literally, he saved her from her plight in that, you know, she's engaged, if you know the story, to, I guess it's the son of somebody rich that's in her class and her status and everything. And, and all the movies have this. It starts out with the person. They're pretty well off. They have this jerk or clown or just doofus guy that's kind of um, promised to them. And then enter Leonardo or Tom Cruise, or whoever the cool, liberated, fun person is that's going to turn their life upside down and show them a life they've never seen before. And that's a reality at times, but she's going way beyond just the saving in that sense. She's going way beyond even the physical saving that you saw in one of the clips where uh, she he's literally giving up his life for hers. What she's talking about is saving her as a person. and. That's the essence of humanism. We're under the sun, so it can't be salvation from any God above. So we have to figure this thing out ourselves. And you know what the reality is? He hasn't had a chance to let her down. How long did he really know her? She didn't give him a chance to even grow old and continue to leave the toilet seat up, for instance. You know what I'm saying? And it's just... There's such a man-centeredness about this. Like, we can do this. He can do this. If Leonardo can do all that, he's the man. And we know he can. And the sad part is that when all of this comes to its futility, to its end, and you realize this person couldn't do what I thought they could do, when you realize that these things that I'm trying to do, whether it's through wisdom, whether it's through pleasure, whether it's through work, possessions, or we'll just call that last one relationships. The reason it can't work is because we're trying to fill a spiritual hole, a vacuum that can only be filled spiritually with tangible physical entities. That's why there's no satisfaction. All those physical things can do is stimulate you. They can't satisfy you. What satisfies you is this. Look at the clip at the bottom. On your left side, you have, let's see if we can get that away. There we go. You have made us for yourself, O oh Lord, and our hearts are restless until 
they rest in you. And that's a quote, a very famous quote from Augustine or St. Augustine, as people refer to him often. It says it all right there. There's a vacuum of the soul, as uh, often philosophers uh, who are believers in the past, past have said, that we try to fill it with all this stuff and you're going to wind up feeling frustrated because it can be only filled by the one who created you. If you're created for a specific purpose by a God who knows that purpose, how are you going to fulfill it in all these other entities? Those are just side things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all those other things will be added unto you. That's the heart of what this book is about. We're still in the bleak section now, but God's showing up soon, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's very similar to Job when we went through Job. When you're reading Job and you hear all the things his friends are saying, there's nothing godly about that. There's nothing scripturally accurate. It's just man's opinions. That's what you've been seeing so far through Solomon, through his experiences. The difference is, is that in Job, God himself shows up and straightens the friends out. And this one, Solomon, because of the wisdom that he had and understanding having a relationship with God, he brings it around himself through the Holy Spirit. For next time, we're going to finish chapter 3 through 12. We're going to focus on with the movie clip one more of the isms that we didn't cover today. And that's going to bring us to understanding not life under the sun, but life above the sun, S-U-N, which is truly life under the S-O-N sun. That's what life is really about. So just remember, you got any comments, any questions, put them on the YouTube page. I'll take a look at them, see if we can incorporate them to what we're doing with the uh, Ecclesiastes part two. And that's what we're going to be the next time we see you. Have a very blessed Resurrection Sunday. And we will see you. And most of all, stay safe, stay inside. And we'll get through this corona thing with the Lord's help. God bless.
Welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Good to see you all. Um, as we go to the Lord's table this morning, the, the title of today's session is Charge for the Ambassador. But before we, we go any further, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we just thank you, Lord, for this time together. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. We pray now, Lord, that you just guide the direction of, of what it is you've given me to share with this this group. And, and we just pray now, Lord, that you just let, let your word go forth with all power and clarity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we think about, we come to the Lord's table this morning to remember the cross work of Jesus Christ. I'd like us to think about our condition our context and our charge as ambassadors for Christ, all within the wrapper of what Christ did for us at the cross. Our primary scripture this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 to 21. And it says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For me, he made, excuse me, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, before we go too far, I wanted to highlight a few key points. So let's look at this term ambassador, a representative. So combined with for Christ means that we're Christ's representatives. So when people engage with us, they need to see Christ and therefore, we need to resemble Christ. We need to be steadfast to continue down that path of maturity to resemble that fullness of Christ spoken of in Ephesians 4. This can only be achieved via time with God's word, prayer, giving, and fellowship. Pleading. In the King, New King James Version, it's pleading. In the NIV, it's appeal. In the King James Version, it's beseech, parakaleo to invite, invoke, to call near. And with it comes an element of emotion and emphasis, meaning to desire or to exhort. So as though in the New King James Version, as though God is pleading through us. The NIV, as though God was making his appeal through us. And in the King James Version, as though God did beseech you by us. Implore, now this word is to pray to petition, to desire, to beg. And mind you, in this letter, there's a number of references to we and us and you. And so the we and us that Paul's referring to in this letter is him and Timothy and others that are traveling with him on or on mission with Paul. And so as it pertains to us, we, those of us who are partaking at the Lord's table, those of us who have been reconciled to God are the we. Now this letter was written to the Corinthian church, and so they were the you referenced here. And it was a blanket message to all in the church, recognizing that some were reconciled to God and some were not. In essence, the church of Corinth was the context audience for the letter. And so this letter goes out not knowing, and Paul doesn't know who's saved and who's not saved or who's been reconciled and who hasn't been reconciled. And um, just like we would go out, and, and share the gospel, not knowing who has been saved and who has not been saved. 
let's talk a minute about current conditions. The global spread of this coronavirus is like nothing ever seen before. And what's interesting is that many of the traditional objects that people put their trust in are being demolished right before our eyes. Some trust in their own intellect or sense of reason. And that's being confounded as we try to consider all that's been happening. The stock market has taken a nosedive showing that financial storehouses can be quickly wiped out. Folks are filing for unemployment in record number. The researchers and doctors are, scram are scrambling to find a cure and our medical staff is extended beyond capacity and we need to continue to pray for them as they're over fatigued and contracting the virus as well. Our global leaders, while they may try to convey a sense of confidence, the most truthful message is that they don't know. Now, while this is a description of the conditions within our society, we, that we Paul is referring to, have a spiritual condition that should help us to see what's happening today through a different lens. And we're reminded of that in John 16, 33, where he says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace and in the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So all that I've just referenced with regards to coronavirus falls under this thing called tribulation, but we can look at this differently. And as I mentioned earlier, when we consider our condition, we need to think about it in the wrapper of what was done for us at the cross and 2 Corinthians chapter five helps paint that picture. And so when we look back at verse 20, we see the phrase, now then. And this instructs us to look at what was said before the now then, and this forms the basis of what comes after the now then. So as we turn to 2 Corinthians 5 and look at 18 and 19, we see starting at 18, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed us to the word of reconciliation. God reconciled us to himself. And this term reconciliation is a restoration to favor, a change on the part of one partly induced by an action on the part of another. And so by virtue of the first occurrence of sin in the garden, we turned away from God, we offended God, we sinned against God, and we were at enmity with God. Romans chapter five really sums it up very nicely. As we look at verses eight to 11, it says here, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You see, he never changed. Because of his love, his mercy, and his grace, he presented the only option for bridging that gap, and that was through Jesus Christ. And because someone shared that with us, and because somebody made it known to us, and because somebody conveyed that word of reconciliation to us, we've turned back to God. We've received that which was offered through Christ. We've been reconciled. And because we've experienced this reconciliation back to God, we must now possess the ministry of reconciliation and therefore be conveyors of that word of reconciliation. And this is the basis for our ambassadorship. And now we think about context. You know, I was listening to the news and, and someone posed the question, do we have a national strategy for defeating this virus? Well, you know, I don't know. And I can't judge if we do or do not have a national strategy. It's not my role to judge. But I do know that God has a universal strategy for salvation that he is operationalizing through each of us 
I spoke earlier about how 2 Corinthians was a letter written to the church in Corinth. And hence the audience context for the letter was those that are in the church. And we have our own context. We have our own audience that we are now supposed to be sharing this word of reconciliation with. And that audience consists of our families, our neighbors, coworkers, friends, people we've met over the years, people we'll continue to meet as we go. All unique to each of us, where we operate, where God has placed us. The interesting thing is that all are experiencing the impacts of the coronavirus spread. So we think about our charge, we know the condition relative to the society in terms of the COVID-19 impacts. We know our spiritual condition of being reconciled back to God and all it means to us. We know our context. We know where God's placed us, who he has us interacting with, who he's allowed us to meet over the years and who he will, who would willing continue to allow us to meet. And we even have the content for the message. We have that word of reconciliation. So let's not, excuse me, let's not let the blanket of coronavirus dominate the message stream. And let's make sure that we're intentional about building each other up as we are a team in God's strategy. We're family. Let's encourage each other to instead send out a different message, being ambassadors for Christ. Let's use the pandemic impacts as a common point of entry. And let's charge forward to implore and beg folks to be reconciled to God. And as we remember what Christ did for us at the cross, let us allow this to fuel our charge, to be the basis for our charge in delivering that word of reconciliation for who knows what's coming tomorrow. Amen. And thank you, uh, Tony Anderson, for that word. And now I'm going to encourage you, if you can get a piece of bread or some juice together, uh, we want to share the Lord's table uh, together. Even though we're apart, we can uh, have this communion time and this worship time together. Remembering that this is the Lord's Supper. It's not Monaco Bible Fellowship Supper. It's the Lord's Supper for the Lord's people. And so we invite anyone who is in fellowship with the Lord, who has received him as personal Lord and Savior, and you're sure that you're in the family of God, to join with us in worshiping him as we remember Jesus and all that he has done for us, even the resurrected Jesus that we celebrate and worship today. And so if you have a piece of bread, uh, this bread reminds us of the body that was broken by our Lord Jesus Christ, the suffering that he did on our part. And as we even celebrate his resurrection today, we remember all that he went through before the resurrection. So let's pray together and thank him for this bread and for all that he has accomplished for us. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, we thank you for being willing through that love to suffer bleed and die for us. And so we are grateful people today because of the great gift of salvation that we have received because you were willing to leave the heights of heaven and come down to this sin-cursed earth and to, to go through and be treated the way that you were treated, even to be crucified and to be buried. But Lord, we are grateful that that wasn't the end of the story, but early that Sunday morning, you rose from the grave. And so we take this bread as you did with your disciples. We remember all that you have accomplished for us. And we just want to tell you that we love you and we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. for us. 
all that your blood has done for us. It has redeemed us from the grip of Satan, from the, the bonds of sin, and set us free in the family of God. And so we just want to say thank you today for the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that, that we have a Savior who has shed his blood, died for us, and yet rose again, that lives today and lives with us and in us and for us, making intercession even for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, we're grateful for all that the blood has done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. And just continue to worship the Lord throughout this day as we remember him, the resurrected Savior, and uh, remember all that he has accomplished for us. God bless you. Well, praise the Lord, everybody, and good morning. Let's get those voices ready. And I need the tenors and the altos and the sopranos as we lift up our voices to the Lord and celebrate this Resurrection Sunday.
Taco Bible Fellowship. This is Pastor Tyrus, and this is the day that the Lord has made, and we are and are already rejoicing in it. And we thank the Lord that though we are not together physically, uh, we, we praise God that social distancing is actually a misnomer. It's not social distancing at all. Uh, it's physical distancing, but we are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We thank the Lord that the church is the ecclesia. We are the called out ones. And so right now we're not called out uh, of our houses to be in a building. But how many people know that because God is in the temple of our hearts that we are together? And so we just thank the Lord for the opportunity uh, to be together in the spirit. And we're going to pray now. And uh, how many know that God is over every situation, including this one. And the scripture says, in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God. And so even in this tough situation, we give thanks, not for it, but in it, because we know that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power, his Holy Ghost power. Come on, somebody that's already working inside of us. So let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, and we honor you, Father, as you taught us to pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, long before we seek your hand, we seek your face. And Father, as we seek your face, Father, we desire intimacy, Lord, with you. And Lord, maybe in this moment, Lord, it's an opportunity for someone to find a moment to be in your presence and to cling and draw nigh unto you. Lord, if we draw nigh unto you, you'll draw nigh unto us. And Father, we pray that maybe there is reconciliation happening among families uh, at this time where, where people are in close quarters. Father, rather than there being uh, tension, Lord, we pray that there will be not a breakout, but a breakthrough, Lord, in, in the midst of those relationships. We pray, Lord, for healing. Lord, we know that some are, are, are sick and, and under the weather, but Father, we know that you're still our Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals us. And so because of that, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would touch the doctors. We pray for those on the front line. And many of us have friends and families that are nurses and doctors and, and, and uh, emergency technicians and those that are uh, in nursing homes and rehab facilities. Father, protect and keep them, Lord. Thank you for their faithful service. Thank you for all that they're doing, Lord, to make things better in this tough situation. Father, we pray, Lord, that there would be a, a great coming together of the church even in this moment, Lord. We pray for those throughout the world and parts of China and Italy and Spain and even we think within our own country and in hot spots like New York and in California where there is a great, great uh, challenge with the virus. But Father, yet we're optimistic, Lord, as, as we begin to know that you can touch the hearts of men and scientists and politicians and those that are in leadership to cause there to be a sway toward uh, your, your people having safety, and, and being, Lord, put in a good place, Father. We thank you for all these things. We, we praise you, Lord, because you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think because of your power in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be blessed, Monica. Be blessed.
Heavenly Father, as we take a look at your word right now, we pray that your spirit would be at work in the hearts and lives of men and women, that the story of your resurrection would not just be uh, something that's in the history book, but something that can transform our lives. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to take a look at this, this account that's given to us in Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, we see uh, the account of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the impact that it had on those ladies that came to the tomb. This resurrection Sunday morning was filled with unusual occurrences, but I want us to leave our consideration of the events at the tomb with Mary and the other women with the same set of instructions that they received. And they were given three things basically to do. And uh, I want us to leave with those same three set of instructions. Come, see, and go. First, notice that the angel invited them to come in verse six. If you take a look at verse six, it was early that Sunday morning when the angel of the Lord descended and rolled the stone away for the risen savior to be released from the tomb. The angel is there sitting on the stone. The guards run away out of fear and the angel addresses the women who came to pay respects to the dead body of Jesus. Then the angel extends an invitation to the women to explore a whole new reality. The resurrection of the dead was not their experience or in their view of reality any more than it is in ours today. And uh, most people stumble over even the, the idea of someone being raised from the dead. The invitation was offered because of the lack of faith to accept the facts simply based on the words and testimony of the angels. Now, doesn't that sound like many of us today? Many of us today, are we struggle over the concept of a resurrection. There are people who struggle over the idea that a dead man could be raised from the grave. But, you know, I, I it amazes me that people who believe in God, people who believe that, that God created the heavens and the earth, people that believe that all of this was created by God, yet they struggle to believe that that same God who flung the stars in space could raise someone from the dead. You see, if you believe in a sovereign God who's the creator of the universe, it should be no struggle that that, that same God could raise someone from the dead, that that same God could heal a blind man, that that same God could cause the lame to walk, that that same God would not find it difficult at all to overcome the obstacle of water to be able to walk to the, his disciples on the boat. And so if we believe that God is God, then the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave should not be a problem. And so the angels, recognizing their faith struggle, said, come, come and see. You see, God knows our faith. He knows that it's weak. And so he extends even to us today an invitation to come. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus invites all who labor and are heavy laden to come and he will give you rest. The truth is that as long as we're not willing to take that first step of faith and come, we'll never be able to know the resurrected Jesus for real and for ourselves. You know, in 1893, I've told this story before about George Ferris uh, he invited his wife and a reporter to ride with him on the inaugural ride on his Ferris wheel. Uh, George Ferris was the inventor of what we now call the Ferris wheel. And when he invited his wife and this reporter on this first ride, you know, they had to take a step of faith. Uh, George knew what size bolts he used. George knew the engineering and construction uh, the strength of, of what he had put into that Ferris wheel. But his wife and the reporter, they stepped into that Ferris wheel simply by faith in George, that George knew what he was doing. Uh, and the Lord is extending us an invitation to come and we won't see for ourselves, we won't experience what God has for us until we too decide to come. And so I, I want to invite you, as these angels invited these women, to come 
and come to that resurrected Jesus. Come and see uh, the empty tomb. But notice also that it was not enough for them to only come, but they were invited to see. In other words, they needed to be witnesses to the experience of the resurrection. Obviously, if you never come, you'll never see. You'll remain in hopeless doubt. However, when you come, the door is open for you to come and experience the blessings of Jesus for yourself. And so come and experience answered prayers. Come and experience forgiveness of sin. Come and experience the removal of, of guilt, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Come and experience that peace that only God can give. Come and experience the fellowship of the family of God. Come and experience the love of God shed abroad in your heart and shared with the world. There are some things that you'll never know when you come, until you come and see for yourself. And so it's like standing on, a, on the side of a pool uh, here in a hot summer day. Uh, imagine your friends are in the pool and they tell you that come and jump in, the water is good. And you stick your toe in the water and it feels cold. And so you hesitate to jump in. Well, it's very much the same way with coming to Jesus, to come and see him. Uh, as long as you stand on the outside and just stick your toe in or pop into church on Christmas and Easter, uh, you'll never experience the resurrected Jesus. But if you take that plunge by faith and enter into that relationship with him, if you dive in head first by faith, then you can come and see the goodness of God. But as witnesses who had come and seen the evidence of the resurrection, these women were then instructed to go quickly and tell the others. In verse seven, they're told to go and tell. Now, I don't think that the angels needed to tell them to go and tell other disciples. Uh, this was the kind of news that you just can't seem to hold for yourself. It's only natural that you're gonna wanna tell others once you personally experience the goodness of God. If Jesus was truly risen from the dead, then it changes everything. It changes their whole perception of reality. And now we have to pay attention to the prophecies about him. Now, once you've experienced and seen his resurrection, you have to listen to the teachings of Jesus in a different way. Now we have to appreciate the love that God must have for us, that he would endure crucifixion and death for us. If Jesus truly is risen, then we can't continue to just ignore that fact. There are implications for how we are supposed to live if Jesus truly rose from the grave. And if truly Jesus is risen, then we have the obligation to tell others to pass this information on. This good news of the gospel will change lives. It will overcome strongholds. It will release the prisoners of sin. And if you're in the pool and you see your friend standing around the side of the pool, sticking their toe in the water, you're gonna to wanna to tell them that the water is great and invite them to jump in with you. If Jesus truly is risen, then you should not only witness with your mouths, but also give witness to the risen Jesus with your lives. We need to allow Jesus to come and reign in our lives so that everyone can see the love of God by the way we live. Some of us have jumped into the pool, but we're bad advertisements for swimming in the water. We're hanging on the side of the pool, not fully taking advantage of all that the water offers. So I wanna to suggest to you that we should be demonstrating a love backstroke that amazes those who are watching us doing all that we can to help the helpless, to love the lost, to forgive the fallen. Our mission here is to make disciples that love God and share his love with the world. And our lives are to be advertising that love of God. If you were charged with loving God and loving others, there would be, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would people see that love being emanated out of your life? And so this invitation is to come, see, and go tell with our mouths and with our lives. But then look at verse eight, 
because this encounter with the empty tomb had them experience both fear and great joy. Notice that they went to tell the others with fear and joy. And those two are not mutually exclusive. It's normally a, a normal thing for us to have a level of fear as you step out to follow the invitation of Jesus. I'm sure that although George Ferris's wife went on that first ride with her husband, she no doubt had a level of fear about getting on that ride. But deciding to accept the invitation to come and see is no different. Uh, and she was able to go and experience that ride and experience the, the thrill of that ride because she obeyed. And we need to also do the same thing. We need to obey and follow Jesus and, and follow his instructions. Deciding to accept the invitation to come see and go uh, is a mixture of fear and joy, but don't let the fear stop you because the spirit of God comes to not give us a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. So the joy of the Lord is that deeply rooted sense of satisfaction that comes when you know that you are where God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do, whether there's fear in your heart about doing it or not. All I can say is that when you accept the invitation to come and see, go and tell, it is an exciting life that will take you to experiences that you wouldn't otherwise have. You know, I remember a time when um, my granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter, went on a, a ride on a, a roller coaster ride in uh, Dorney Park. And uh, after she came down off that ride, uh, she was scared to get on, but she went on the ride. And when we got off the ride, uh, we started walking back to her rest of the family and she started walking a little faster and faster. The closest we got, the faster she walked until she ran ahead of me to go and tell the rest of the family about her ride on the roller coaster. And it's much the same way as Christians. We might have fear to go and experience and obey some of the things that God tells us to do. But by faith, when we follow him and we obey him, it becomes a point of joy and, and excitement for us to go and share that with others. And so I wanna challenge you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've come and seen, then we need to challenge ourselves to overcome that fear and be able to be witnesses to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if you're here listening to me today and you've never experienced the resurrected Jesus, he's never been invited into your life, you've never walked with him, then I want to uh, have you consider the fact that today can be a day when you take that first step of faith. Would you do it? Right now, you can do it just simply by prayer. You can acknowledge your need for him in your life. You can acknowledge that, that you are a sinner and ask him to come in and forgive you. Ask him to come in and rule and reign in your life. Hand over the throne of your heart to him and allow him to be your king. You can take that step without joining anything. You can do it simply by prayer, right where you are right now. Just by prayer, ask him to be your Lord and savior. And you know what? If you come and see today, Jesus promises that if you come to him, if you open your heart to him, he will in no wise cast that cast you out. He will come and make himself known to you. And so I invite you to do that. And if that's your desire, then I also invite you to contact us and let us know. And we would love to be your servants for Christ's sake and to help you to wherever you are, find a church that is a Bible believing church that can help you to, to stand up and be counted for Jesus Christ and to grow in him. And if you're in the area of Marco Bible Fellowship, we invite you to come and visit with us and uh, learn and grow in our fellowship as well. So God bless you and may the Lord's peace shine upon you.